Searching on Google is this sort of underrated skill that everybody thinks they have, but almost nobody does. And if you ask your friends to rate themselves on how well they navigate Google from, say, 1 to 10, they're likely to give you something in the range of, say, 6 to 8, even though very few people know the basics of Google search and all of the ways you can modify your search terms to get the exact information you're looking for. Now, there's a really simple way for you to evaluate somebody's Google search skills. Just ask them to retrieve something specific on Google and count the number of times, queries, and pages they need to reach that information. Also count when they come back to the previous page. You'll notice that the number can get pretty big very quickly. What this course will teach you is how to be a Google sniper. You want to be a 10. In one or two queries, you want to instantly find the information you're looking for. And by learning to use more refined queries instead of simple words and hopeful clicking, you'll spend less time endlessly searching for something on Google. Move from being a word and click Googler to a one shot, one hit Googler. We hope that you'll enjoy this tutorial. Before we get started with all the amazing functionalities and features of Google Search, it's important for you to know six of its most basic default settings. First of all, Google Search is case insensitive. It doesn't matter whether you type in dog in lowercase letters, whether you capitalize the D, or whether you capitalize the whole thing, they'll all be considered the same search term. Number two, Google search is indifferent to whether a word is plural or not, so dog and dogs will be considered the same keywords. Number three, Google search will also consider alternatives to your words, so for example if you type in dog cat, it will look up pets as well. Number four, Google search adds the word and whenever you use a blank space between elements in your searches. So for example, when you type in Pizzeria Washington, it will only show results containing both terms rather than just one or the other. Fifth, Google search will ignore parentheses, so you don't have to bother grouping your keywords together. And finally, number six, search results will be displayed by relevance according to Google. So remember to keep these rules in mind as you're going through the course, and now that you have a clear starting point, you can get started with the tutorial. Welcome to the lecture on the AND operator. The AND operator is a binary operator. It means that it takes two operands. What it will do is that it will return results that contain those two operands. If you want to implement the AND operator, you will have to use a blank space between the two operands. If you write and, it's going to consider and as a word. So for example, if you want results containing dog and cat, you will want to write dog blank space cat, because if you write dog and cat, it's going to consider dog, and, and cat as their own words, and it will return results accordingly. Because Google ignores parentheses, the end operator will always connect its clauses neighboring operands. Keep this in mind. For example, if you have three words and two of them are between parentheses, it's going to do as if the parentheses were not here. You can use multiple N operators in a row, it will work as usual, and it will connect the two operands on the left hand side and right hand side. Remember, 
Returning results with the two operands is the best case scenario. In some cases, if there are not so many results with the operands you want, it may return only one of them. Thanks for having watched this lecture and I hope you understand how the AND operator works now. So let's take a quick look at how the AND operator works. So as you can see, you will need two operands and in the middle you will have to use a blank space. Something like this, like if you wanted dog and cat, you would need the blank space between dog and cat. It would implicitly add the AND operator between the two operands. Let's take a look at Google. If I type something like Panama, it would give me the result that has to do with Panama, as you can see, the keyword Panama, visit Panama, reporter on the Panama Papers, etc. Sometimes it's just Panama, sometimes it's Panama Papers. But now, say I want to specifically on the Panama Papers, so I could type Panama Papers. And as you can see, what is going on here is that it's like an end operator. It's implicitly added, so Panama Papers is like Panama and Papers. And now we've got the two keywords, Panama and Papers. So you can see Panama Papers, Panama Papers everywhere. And because it's such a popular term, and because it's such a popular expression, you're not going to find Panama on one. You're probably not going to find results that only have Panama or that only have Papers. Sometimes it happens when there are not so many results. So you see Panama Papers. But imagine now I want something even more specific. I want something that has to do with the Panama Papers and France. So I would type Panama Papers France. And now you see that there is French. Panama Papers French. French is not exactly France. So you see that it's a bit of an equivalent, but not exactly the same. That's uh, important. Here you see France, Panama, France Papers, etc. So what it did here is that it added N and it added N. So Panama and Papers and France. So the results would have to contain the three words. Sometimes it's just going to return one of the three words, sometimes two of them. But if it's a very popular term, probably you're going to get a lot of results that contain all the keywords. Welcome to the lecture on the OR operator. The OR operator is a binary operator. It takes two operands and it will return results containing one of the two operands or both of them. For example, if you wanted results containing dog or cat, return results containing dog, results containing cat, and results containing dog and cat. If you want to implement the OR operator, you can either write OR in capital letters, or you can use a vertical bar. It's going to do exactly the same thing. Remember, because Google ignores parentheses, the R operator will apply to its closest neighboring operands. So for example, if you have two words between parentheses or another word, it's going to apply R to the last two words. You can use multiple R operators in a row, and it's going to work as usual. It will apply it to the right-hand side and left-hand side operands.
Thanks for having watched this lecture on the R operator. As you can see, it's a bit less restrictive than the N operator, and you may use it when you want results containing one of the two operands or both of them. As, as you've learned, if you want to use the R operator, you have to put it between two operands, either by using an uppercase R or by using a symbol, which is a vertical bar. And you see it's binary, it takes two operands, and you can implement it like this, dog or cat, or something like Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. If you wanted to use it on Google, let's say, because we followed the elections between Clinton and Donald Trump, you could use something like Trump or Clinton. Then we type enter. And so what would happen here, as you can see, is that the first result says Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. How come? That's because our operator can return results that contain the two operands. But then you continue here, it's just Donald Trump. Here it's Trump or Clinton. Here Trump Clinton. Here Trump Clinton. Trump Clinton, etc. So you see, depending on what you're looking for, if you use the R operator, you may get more results that contain the two operands, and sometimes only one operand. Usually when you use the R operator, that's, that's because you're more flexible than with the N operator. You th we think something like, I'm okay with just finding one of the two results. It's okay. It doesn't have to be the two keywords. So what you do is Tram Clinton is I'm okay with finding results that have, that contain I'm okay with finding results that contain only Tram or only Clinton. And it can be very useful sometimes because you're not too sure what you're going to find. The thing is that you can couple operators together. So for example, if you're here you say Trump or Clinton. You could use an, an operator here and say something like here see Florida. So Florida, so it's Trump or Clinton Florida. What, what happens is that the an operator is added implicitly between Clinton and Florida. And R applies to Trump and Clinton. So it's going to be something like Clinton or Florida and Trump or Clinton. So if you go and take a look, you can see here Florida, Trump, Clinton. Here, Florida, Trump. Here this is kind of weird because you see Florida and Trump and you would expect that it would be something like Clinton, Florida or Trump. But here it's Trump and Florida. So it looks, looks like sometimes an operator is not only implicitly added between this operand and this operand, but also between this operand and this operand. And if we continue, as you can see, sometimes it contains Clinton, Florida, Trump. Hello and welcome to the section on the NOT operator. The NOT operator is a unary operator, only takes one operand, and it excludes any search result that contains this operand. If you want to implement the NOT operator, you have to use the minus symbol. It has to be just before what you want to exclude, and it has no syntactical equivalent. So if you want to exclude anything from a query, you will have to use the symbol. If you use a blank space between the minus symbol and the operand, it's going to consider the operand as an expression or a word by itself. When you use the NOT operator, it's going to apply to the whole query. It doesn't matter if it is between, let's say, an AND and an OR operator, or before something, or after something. In any case, in the end, it's going to apply to the whole query. You can use multiple NOT operators in a row, it's not a problem. If they have their own respective operands, they're going to exclude their respective operands. The results containing these operands will be excluded.
Now the NOT operator is a bit different from R and N because if you remember, we saw that AND is a binary operator, so it takes two operands. The OR operator is also binary, it takes two operands. And here NOT is actually unary, it takes only one operand. So when you're going to use the NOT operator, it's going to apply only to its operand. So here you see dog minus cat is something like dog and exclude cat. Here it's like Monday, excludes Tuesday and Wednesday. If you take a look at Google and say we come back to our example with Trump, Clinton in Florida and we say something like uh, Clinton minus Trump and Florida. To exclude the keyword Trump from all the search results, it will do something like Clinton and Florida. So you're going to find Clinton, Florida, Clinton, Florida, etc. And Trump will be excluded from the search results. It doesn't matter where the not operator is. See, that is something like uh, minus Trump, Clinton, Florida it would be exactly the same. That's one of the particularities of the not operator. You can basically use it anywhere in your query and it will apply to the whole query. So, and if we did minus Clinton, Clinton, Florida, so what would happen now? Oh, there are no results. That's because we included Clinton. So it works fine. We can also stack multiple not operators. If you see minus Clinton, minus Trump and elections, I wonder what we're going to find because probably not so many interesting results. So you see, looks like a completely useless result because uh, there is no Clinton, no Trump. And if we go down, you see election, federal election, state elections. So you see there is an article from the Baltimore Sun that doesn't have the Clinton and Trump keywords, same for New York Times. So you wonder what they're talking about. Oh, here you can see elections in India has nothing to do with the United States. So you can stack up as many not operators as you want. It's going to work fine and you can put them anywhere. Welcome to the lecture on the double quote specifier. The double quote specifier can take any number of operands what it does is that it will return search results that contain these operands in the very order you wrote them. Keep in mind that the double quote specifier doesn't have any syntactical equivalent. For example, if you use single quotes, it's not going to work. The double quote specifier is case insensitive. It doesn't matter if you use an uppercase letter or lowercase letter, it will consider it the same. Also, it's singular plural insensitive. If you use something like dog, it's going to consider it the same as dogs. So you may get results that contain the plural forms or a single word. Also, it may return synonyms. For example, if you type something like dog and cat, it may return something like pets. Please keep in mind that the double quote specifier and its operands are treated as a single expression by logical operators. For example, if you use the OR operator on the double quote specifier with its operands, it's going to consider it all as an expression, so it will be this whole thing or something else.
So as you can see, the exact match actually takes one operand, and so it consists in putting quotes, opening quotes, and closing quotes, and you're supposed to get an exact match. And you can stack up logical operators between exact matches. For example, here I want A, and then there is an N operator, which is a space here, and another exact match, and B, and then there is the R operator, and then NC, which is an exact match. There are NRE operands. What does this mean, NRE? It means that you have at least you have one operand. If you use double quotes on nothing, it's going to do nothing. You have to use at least one operand to make it work. If you take a look at Google, you'll see that the, the exact match is a bit inconsistent. That's one of the problems of Google. They're not very consistent and logical all of the time. If you use the night sky, you'll see night sky. What I asked is the night sky, and they, and they show me night sky. So as you can see, the exact match is not always accurate. That's a problem. If I want to use the exact match, I want an exact result. And if we continue, as you can see, night sky, so we continue, here it is the night sky, here is the night sky, here is the night sky, etc. But as you see, the first results do not match exactly. So this pacifier is not very accurate all of the time, so you should expect that it's not going to return exactly what you want. If you use something like the blue fridge red fish, this is a complete garbage thing. So you see here, they'll show you fish red, red fish, fish blue, but as you see, what the hell, I asked for the blue fridge, red fish, and they show me something that has nothing to do, refrigerator, red, I want the whole expression or nothing, supposedly that's how an exact match would work, but as you can see with Google, it's not working. Welcome to the section on the wildcard. The wildcard is a placeholder that can take any number of operands. What it does is that it will return results that contain all the operands and something to replace the wildcard. What it tells Google is that you already know some of the information and that what is important to you is the structure. The wildcard has no syntactical equivalent. If you use a blank space, it will just be considered as an N operator. It won't tell Google that you want something instead of it. You cannot use a wildcard alone. Basically, you have to provide additional information so Google understands that you have some of the information but not all of it and what you want is results that contain this information and some additional information that you didn't provide. When you use a wildcard along its operands, it will be considered as a single expression. So that's very handy when you want to use logical operators and that you want to apply it to the whole expression and not just to the wildcard. Thanks for having watched this lecture. I hope that you understand the wildcard is really a structural specifier. It is something you use when you know some of the information but not all of it. If we continue on the common specifiers, we can take a look at the placeholder. So you saw that the placeholder is something like this. You put an asterisk between the operands and supposedly it will return results that contain the operands in this order with something to replace the placeholder. 
it's anary in the sense that you have to use at least one operand. If you just use the asterisk, it won't mean anything to Google, or maybe it will return one word. So let's take a look. If I do just uh, asterisk, nothing, you see? And if I do something like the asterisk sky, what we can see is it's returning weird stuff like the earth sky stars. Is this what I asked for? No, it's not. What I wanted was the something sky. And what it understands here is I want the and I want something and I want sky. So it's not going to understand that you want this expression. You see, if we continue red sky at night, where is my expression? It's nowhere. The something sky is not happening. You see sky, sky, it's not what I want. So that's why you have to use the exact match. If you want to specify the order, you want to say, no, no, what I want is the something sky. You say, opening quotes, closing quotes, and you go on. And then what happens here is the is the evening sky, the night sky, the night sky, the term sky, etc. So, so keep this in mind, exact match will preserve the order. If you don't use the exact match, it won't preserve the order. It's very important. You can stack up your expression with another one like the night sky or say the something fridge. Okay, so now we have the night sky, the night sky, the night sky, the dark sky. Where is my fridge? Where is my fridge? Can't find my fridge. Dark sky. So that's one of the issues with Google in general. It is that if one of the two expressions is much more popular than the other one, for example, the night sky is much more popular than the something fridge, it's going to return so many results from the first expression that you won't see anything from this one. Maybe if we go on 10th result, we will find something. Let's see. The night sky, the sea, the prestigious sky, it still is continuing. Let's continue. Oh, now there is no result. The night sky, it's not finding anything, and which is pretty weird. So let's try something more popular. We say something like placeholder Obama. And now we see President Obama. Oh, so now that's much more popular than the night nice sky, President Obama. You see the Obama, whether Obama, etc. So keep in mind how popular an expression is will determine how many results we'll see from it. And one may hide the other one if it's too popular. Welcome to the section on the range specifier. The range specifier is binary. It takes two operands. If you want to implement the range specifier, you have to write a first operand, which will be the lower bound, then two dots, and then another operand, which will be the higher bound. It's going to return search results that contain a numerical value within this range. Remember that there should be no blank space between the operands and the double dots, otherwise it's going to consider them as word expressions. The range specifier has no syntactical equivalent. You can use the OR and the AND logical operators on a range. It's going to consider the specifier and its operands as an expression. However, you cannot use the NOT logical operator on a range. Thanks for having watched this lecture on the range specifier. I hope that you understand it can be very handy when you're not too sure of a price and you want something that is between lower bound and a higher bound. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at the range. The range is the third most common specifier. And something you put between up range, as you can see, what it's going to do is it will return a numerical value within the range and it's binary. So you need one expression on the left and one expression on the right. By the way, it's not written here, but you can actually use it on dates. So let's take a look at Google, for example. If I'm looking for something like an iPhone, say something like iPhone, then I can use the dollar symbol and say, I want an iPhone between 100 and $200. So what happens here is it shows me a result that don't fit so much because what the hell, zero dollars, uh, that's bullshit. Then you see $615, that's not what I asked. So that's because that's a sponsored link. So it doesn't match with what I typed in. It's so iPhone, it's so the dollar symbol. So it said, oh, this guy wants to buy an iPhone. Let's show the, let's show the ads. But if we go down a bit and we take a look, maybe we will find something interesting. Oh, here you see iPhone 5S, which $200. So that's kind of spot on $160, $100, etc. It's still not so much what we were looking for. So we'll have to specify a side because here it's too general and it's about articles talking about the iPhone and its price. What I want is to find an iPhone with its price. So I will say something like site amazon.com and now we're looking for uh, iPhones and Amazon. So you see here like a hundred dollars for an iPhone. It's unblocked, continue, use from $120, etc. So it's working kind of fine, kind of fine. Not so much because let's say we click on this and we will check if that's correct. Here, see $260. So that was not what was indicated here. It is kind, kind of lying in a way. It's kind of lying. So let's take a look at eBay now and see if there is a difference if we change the site. Now we see eBay. Okay, so 169. So let's take, let's take a look. And now on eBay, you see they're not lying. That's now it's 177. That's not bullshit. Here, 189. So let's take a look as well. So here it's working as well. So as you can see, these little bastards from Amazon, they're kind of lying. But if you take a look at eBay, it's working fine. So it really depends on the site and depends on the source where you're looking for the information. If you use the range on some sites, it may work and on some others, it may not work at all. So be careful what site you use. So pay attention and with time, you will see that it works with some sites and not with all sites. Welcome to the section on the define and translate specifiers. The define specifier is a unary specifier. It takes one operand and it returns a definition according to Google Dictionary. The colon is optional and it can be replaced by a blank space. So for example, if you want to define, say, the word love, you can write define colon love or you can write define blank space love. Remember that the define shortcut only works with English words. You cannot use logical operators when you use the define shortcut, otherwise it's going to break its functionalities. When you use the define shortcut, it's going to provide you with more information about the word. You also can get additional information about the word, such as its etymological rule and its recurrence over time on Google.
The translate specifier is a binary specifier. It takes two operands, the word that you want to translate and the target language. The colon is optional, it can be replaced by a blank space. For example, you can write translate blank space love blank space French. It's going to translate love in French. Like for the defined specifier, you cannot apply logical operators to translate. It's going to break its functionalities. Remember that the translator is based on Google Translate's API, so it has the same limitations. Thanks for having watched this lecture on the Define and Translate specifiers. I hope that you see there are useful shortcuts to get a definition or a translation. Welcome to the section on the weather, time and location specifiers. The weather specifier returns the weather according to Google's own provisions database of the place it applies to. For example, if you ask for the weather of Paris in France, it's going to give you the weather of Paris in France according to their own provisions. The colon is not mandatory, it can be replaced by blank space. So for example, if you type weather blank space Paris, it's going to do the same as weather colon Paris. When two places have the same name, you have to provide additional information. So for example, as you know, there is a Paris in Texas as well. So if you want the weather of Paris in Texas, you will have to write Paris, comma, Texas, or TX. When you use logical operators on the weather specifier, it's going to break it down. It won't work anymore. The locations specifier return Google map coordinates. The colon is not mandatory and it can be replaced by a blank space. So for example, you can write locations colon Paris and it's going to give you the location of Paris on Google map. Or you can write locations blank space Paris and it's going to do exactly the same. If two places have the same name, you have to specify the country. If you try to type locations colon Paris comma TX, it's not going to work. You will have to write Paris comma US. As for the weather specifier, logical operators will break the location's specifier. The time specifier is a unary operand. The time specifier returns the current time of its operand. 
As for weather and locations, the column is not mandatory and you can replace it by a blank space. And as for weather and locations, using logical operators will break the time specifier. If two places have the same name, the same rules as for the weather specifier will apply to the time specifier. Thanks for having watched this lecture. I hope that you understand the point of using weather, locations and time. Welcome to the section on Google Calculator. Google's internal calculator is a Google-hosted calculator. It can perform arithmetical calculations and basic function plotting. The calculator will get cold if you use mathematical syntax. If you mix up the mathematical syntax with non-mathematical syntax, the calculator won't get cold. It follows the usual rules of PEMDAS. First goes parentheses, then exponents, then multiplications and divisions, and then additions and subtractions. The calculator will ignore blank spaces between mathematical operators and mathematical operands. You can graph multiple functions at once if you separate them by a comma. Thanks for having watched this lecture. I hope that you see the Google Calculator can be useful, but it has its limitations. Welcome to the section on the Google Converter. The Google Converter takes a numerical value of a certain unit of measurement and converts it into its equivalent numerical value in another unit of measurement. The converter only works if the source unit of measurement and the target unit of measurement are convertible. For example, you can convert inches to miles per hour, but you can't convert inches to dollars.
The converter understands full unit names such as feet, abbreviations such as FT, and symbols such as the dollar symbol. You can either use a blank space or two between the source and the target values. The converter is rather complete and you can convert many different kinds of units such as volumes, speed, frequencies, etc but it also has its limitations. Thanks for having watched this lecture on the Google Converter. Welcome to the section on the site specifier. The site specifier is a unary specifier. It takes one operand. What it does is that it returns results that have a URL that contains its operand. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. If you use a blank space instead of a colon, Google will consider the word site and the operand as separate words. The operand can be a country code, for example, F, for example, FR for French URLs. If you use the site specifier and that you have two operands and use the OR operator between the two operands, what the site specifier will do is that it will only apply to the right one and it will ignore the one on the left. When you use the OR and the NOT operators between two site specifiers, it will work as usual. If you use the AND operator, which means if you use a blank space, it will break Thanks for having watched this lecture on the site specifier. As you can see, it can be very useful when you want content from a very specific URL. Welcome to the section on the file type specifier. The file type specifier is a unary specifier. It takes one operand. What it does is that it returns results that contain a file of the specified type. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space between the specifier and its operand.
Using multiple file type specifiers in a query will only consider the first one and it will ignore the other ones. If you want to find the list of the accepted file types, you can do this in going to the Google Advanced Search interface. You will have a list of all the accepted file types. The file type specifier is really potent when used along other specifiers, such as the site specifier. Welcome to the section on the related specifier. The related specifier is a unary specifier. It takes only one operand and it returns the root domain of similar websites. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. Otherwise, Google will consider the related specifier and the URL as their own words. When you use a related expression and other expressions on its right hand side, it's going to ignore them and just consider the related expression. When using logical operators between two related expressions, the right-hand side expression will get ignored. Remember, relatedness is defined by Google according to internal criteria that may not be intuitive. Welcome to the section on the link specifier. The link specifier is a unary specifier. It takes one operand and it returns a few selected results that point to this URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. When you use logical operators between the link expression and other expressions, it will basically break it, it won't work anymore.
If you want to trace the backlinks of a URL, it's more efficient to use the double quotes and the not operator. Welcome to the section on the cache specifier. The cache specifier is a unary specifier, takes one operon, which is a URL, and it returns a cached version of a web page at a specific date and time. The colon is mandatory, and there should be no blank space between the specifier and its operand. It's normally not possible to retrieve previous versions of a web page cache other than the one proposed by Google. Any web page indexed by Google will have a cached version on Google's end. Hello and welcome to the section on the info specifier. The info specifier is a unary specifier. What it does is that it returns its operands URL and Google suggested specifiers applied to this URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. Beware, the info specifier will consider everything on its right as its operand. Because you already know how to use all the suggested specifiers, you may directly use them on the URL instead of using info. Welcome to the section on the in-URL and all-in-URL specifiers. The in-URL specifier is a unary specifier. It takes one operand and it returns results containing the operand in their URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. The in URL will only apply to its operand and it will ignore other expressions on its right.
Using the OR operator on its operand will make InUrl work as if it was called on each operand or both of them. You can use logical operators between two InUrl and they will work as usual. The all in URL specifier is an NRE specifier, can take any number of operands. It will return results with the URL containing the N operands. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. Each word expression on its right-hand side will be considered as its operand if it doesn't have its own specifier. Using the OR operator between two operands will make the all-in URL work as if it was called on each of them, or both of them. Welcome to the section on the entitle and all entitle specifiers. The entitle specifier is a unary specifier. It takes only one operand and it returns results containing the operand in the document's title or its URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. The entitled specifier applies to its operand and ignores other expressions on its right. When you use the OR operator on its operands, it will make as if the entitled was called for each of them or both of them. Using logical operators between multiple entitled specifiers will work as usual. The all entitled specifier is an NRA specifier, can take any number of operands. It returns results that contain all the operands in the document's title or the URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space.
The All in Title specifier will consider any word expression on its right hand side as its outbrand. Using the R operator on its operands will make all in title work as if it was called on each operand or both. When you use the N operator between two all in title specifiers, it will break them, but if you use the R or the NOT operators, it will make the right hand side expression ignored. Welcome to the section on the in anchor and all in anchor specifiers. The in anchor specifier is a unary specifier, takes only one operand. It returns results that contain the operand in the anchor text of the URL. The colon is mandatory, there should be no blank space. The in anchor specifier applies to its right hand side operand and ignores other words. When you use the OR operator on its operands, the in anchor specifier will work as if it was called on each of them or both of them. You can use multiple in anchor specifiers in the same query without breaking its functionalities. The all in anchor specifier is an NRA specifier, it can take any number of operands. What it does is that it returns results that contain all the operands in the anchor text or the URL. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. The all in anchor specifier will apply to all the words on its right hand side that don't have their own specifier.
Like for in anchor, when you use the R operator in its operands, the all in anchor will do as if it was called for each operand or both of them. You can use the OR and the NOT operators between the all in anchor expressions, but the AND operator will break them. Welcome to the section on the in-text and all in-text specifiers. The in-text specifier is a universe specifier. It takes only one operand and it returns results that contain the operand in their URL or document's text. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. The in-text specifier only applies to its right-hand side operand. When you use the R operator between its operands, it will work as if it was called for each operand or both of them. You can use multiple in-text specifiers in a row, it will work as usual. The all in text specifier is an NRE specifier, can take any number of operands. What it does is that it returns results that contain all its operands in the URL or the document's text. The colon is mandatory and there should be no blank space. The all in text specifier will consider any word expression on its right as its operand. When you use the R operator between its operands, the all in text specifier will work as if it was called on each of them or both of them. Welcome to the section on the advanced search interface. In the first half of the interface, you can specify a sequence of N operators. You can also specify a sequence of double quote specifiers. You can specify a sequence of OR operators. You can specify a sequence of NOT operators. You can also specify a range.
In the second half of the advanced search interface, you can specify a language, you can also specify a region, you can also specify an update time, you can use the site specifier, you can apply one of the metadata specifiers, you can activate the save search, you can use a file time specifier, you can specify the usage rights. Welcome to the section on the custom settings. In the custom settings, you can activate the save search. You can also activate the instant results. You can set up the number of results from 10 to 100. You can activate the speech to text for voice search. You can also set up results to open in a new window tab. If you've reached this point, it means that you've probably watched most of the previous lectures. Now, we covered a lot, so I just want to do a quick summary of everything you've learned so far. In the first section, you learn the default settings of Google Search in that it doesn't matter whether you use upper or lowercase letters or whether a word is plural or not. You also learn that Google can sometimes return approximations or synonyms for your search terms, and that it also adds the word and, as we call the logical operator, between search terms and returns results by relevance. In the second section, you learn how to use the three logical operators, the word and, as we just mentioned, as implemented by a blank space, meaning it returns results containing the operand or keyword on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the space. You also learn the OR operator as implemented by the word OR or the vertical bar and this returns results containing either the left-hand side or the right-hand side operand or both. And finally you learn the NOT operator as implemented by the minus symbol which excludes its operand or keyword again from the search results. In the third section, you learn how to use three useful punctuators, the quotation marks, which return results keeping the word order and spelling, the range, which returns results containing numericals within the two bounds, and the wildcard, which works as a placeholder and returns results with the same words and word order. In section four, you learn how to use shortcuts, the define specifier to get the definition of an English word, the translate specifier to translate a word to a target language, the weather, locations, and time specifiers to get the weather, coordinates, or time of any given place, the calculator functionalities to calculate numerical results and plot single variable functions, and the converter functionalities to convert numericals from a unit of measurement to another unit of measurement. Section 5, you learn how to use specifiers to refine your search results, the site specifier to get results from a particular domain name or a country code, the file type specifier to get results containing a specific file type, the related specifier to get similar websites according to Google, the cache specifier to get a copy of a site on a given date, 
and the info specifier to get the root domain of a site and suggested specifiers applied to it. Then in section 6 you learn how to use specifiers on metadata the in URL and all in URL specifiers to get results with a URL containing your words, the in text and all in text specifiers to get results with a URL or a document's text containing your keywords, the in title or all in title specifiers to get results with a URL or a title containing your keywords, and the in anchor and all in anchor specifiers to get results with a URL or anchor text containing your keywords. You've also learned how to use the advanced search interface and how to customize your search settings. Now that's a lot of stuff, and you now know more about searching on Google than probably 99% of your friends. So we want to thank you for going through the course. We really hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it for you.